Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Joining me now is Dr. William Kraft, the president of Concordia College. In fact, the new president. And welcome, Dr. Kraft. Delighted to be here with you, John. Well, as we get started, tell the viewers out there a little bit about yourself and your background. I grew up along with my wife, Ann, in a little western Pennsylvania college town called New Wilmington. Uh, my mom and my wife's mom were both school teachers there, and my uh, wife's father was a history professor there at Westminster College, and my dad and granddad uh, built college buildings there. So I grew up surrounded by teachers uh, and uh, by builders, and I, I think I've been inspired by uh, their work for you know, the rest of my life. Um, and we had a wonderful, wonderful childhood there. Uh, graduated from Westminster, as did everyone in my family and everyone in my wife's family, mm -hmm. uh, not unlike a lot of families at Concordia, where there's a long uh, family legacy. And then uh, we moved off to North Carolina, uh, where my wife uh, worked at the university uh, at Chapel Hill, and I got my uh, master's and doctorate in uh, English Lit there. So I uh, traveled south and then traveled back uh, north again, uh, settled in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where my wife taught school. Uh, and I worked uh, at Mount St. Mary's College uh, in Maryland, just across the Mason-Dixon line, about 15 miles south. I uh, was uh, an English prof there uh, and uh, became the department chair and then the dean of undergraduate studies. Uh, and after I'd been there for quite a while, I got a call from the president at Luther College. Uh, Richard Torgerson is his name, and he's a 1964 graduate of Concordia. Uh, so lots of connections here. Uh, and uh, he invited me to apply for the role of dean and vice president of the college, uh, which I did, uh, and was really lucky to, to win that position uh, and spent uh, 11 very, very happy years there working with the faculty and staff and students. And then just this last year, um, received uh, a nomination for the presidency at Concordia, and once again threw in my name, uh, and here I am. Well, so talk about the transition uh, of going to the presidency job. Well, it's a wonderful thing. It's, uh, if you're the dean of the college, you're responsible for the academic program, mm -hmm. and so the majority of the work that you do is campus-focused uh, and focused on the uh, academic program to ensure that it is as strong uh, in its conception and its uh, practice as possible. So most of the work that I did at, at Luther was focused on that. As president, of course, I uh, have responsibility for the college in a wider sense. So I work with our terrific provost, Mark Creechy, uh, who oversees the academic program and with all of the members of the cabinet uh, at the college. But I have the great opportunity to be engaged not only with uh, my partners on the campus, but my partners here in Fargo-Moorhead with the wide range of uh, Concordia alums across the country uh, and with friends and supporters of the college uh, almost everywhere. Hmm. Well, it sounds like with your connections, your background, uh, you already ha have a pretty good impression of Concordia before you ever got there. What, what are your impressions? Well, Concordia was well known to me. Mm -hmm. I spent uh, 11 years on the, on the dean's circuit uh, with the ELCA Lutheran Colleges, and so I got to know Concordia pretty well. Uh, I knew Paul Dovery, uh, mm -hmm. who was uh, and is uh, an iconic figure in Lutheran higher education, a kind of defining figure for all of us. And as I said, uh, my boss at Luther, Richard Torgerson, was a Concordia grad. Um, the things that impressed me, about Concordia, and I think it drew me into the search beyond those personal connections were, well, first of all, the integrity of the college, uh, its deep commitment to the integration of faith and learning uh, in the lives uh, of its students. So our students uh, pursue a, a rigorous uh, exploration of the liberal arts, and at the same time, they're involved in faith and values development that serve them for the rest of their lives. So I was deeply impressed by the integrity of the college. This is a college that knows what it is uh, and knows what it wants to do. I was drawn also by the uh, curriculum of the college, which is uh, a curriculum of genuine national distinction. All the students at Concordia are called to become responsibly engaged in the world. Uh, it's an acronym at the college at this point, BREW, uh, which leads to all sorts of interesting puns, as you might mm -hmm. imagine, uh, among the faculty and the students. But we're always brewing at Concordia to try to understand how we can become strong national and, and world citizens. 
Um, so the integrity of the college, the distinction of its curriculum, and the thing that Concordia is deeply known for across the country is its commitment to global learning. Uh, this is a, a college of genuine global reach uh, in the programs that its students take part in. We're often in the, in the top 10 in the country in terms of the percentage of students who study internationally. And we're working very hard to create uh, opportunities for international learning when students are on campus as well as on. And then, as you probably know, the college is well known mm -hmm. for its uh, terrific program in music. Uh, my wife and I have been choir members all of our life, so we feel like we've landed in paradise there. Uh, it has a strong record uh, in the placement of its graduates in natural science. Uh, there's the wonderful promise of the newly conceived uh, Offutt School of, of Business, and then strong foundations in the humanities uh, and uh, in the social sciences as well. So uh, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, for me to come to a college of such great strengths and uh, to build on that legacy. Well, with that said, we're going to touch on some of, some of those subjects a little bit later, but I understand that you're committed to meeting with students individually. Uh, it's got to be tough with the number of students you've got, and how's that going? Or well, it's going well, in, in part because uh, I live at the corner of campus. Uh, Ann and I live in a beautiful uh, 1910 sort of Tudor house that's on the corner of H Street. Uh, and so every morning I get to walk through that beautiful canopy of elms uh, from my house down to Lorenzen, where my office is. And I'm in conversation with students all the time there. There are many informal opportunities for me to, to meet with students. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had 725 new students over to our house uh, for uh, a welcome. Uh, I did talk to each of them individually, but it was uh, a pretty quick, uh, pretty quick thing. So uh, there are so many opportunities for me. I've been going around and meeting each of the uh, sports teams. Um, I'm uh, starting to attend uh, musical events. Uh, we were really well welcomed by the uh, student orientation team that helps bring in and acclimate uh, the new first-year students and, and transfers. Uh, we even got a transfer beanie uh, to wear uh, from Concordia that I got to toss uh, on uh, Convocation Day. Um, mm. So there are lots of opportunities. Uh, students from uh, the uh, Concordia magazine have been in to, I mean, Concordia newspaper have been in to see me, and many opportunities for that. And I like just to drop in, too, sure. all kinds of times. Well, you know, you, a lot of your backgrounds in teaching and, and, mm -hmm. and some professional work. Is, is teaching your first love or? Teaching is what brought me in to this. Uh, well, I should say, from my childhood on, a love of stories. Uh, I grew up hearing a lot of stories about my family, my immediate family, and my extended family. And I was lucky to have uh, mom and dad who had books around everywhere and so started reading. And uh, then when I got to school, when I got to college, I, I discovered that people could make a living uh, talking uh, about literature and history, philosophy and science, and so I threw myself into that. And I've actually continued to teach throughout my career, even though for the last uh, 15 years or more I've been a, a college administrator. Okay. Can you talk about some of the main challenges uh, you've had, uh, you know, as you, as you start into the job of being the college president? Well, uh, the cliche is that being a new college president is like drinking from a fire hose. Mm -hmm. And there are, but I, let me say that I really like what's coming out of the hose at, at Concordia, but there are many, many people to meet, uh, not only on campus, but, but off campus. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to travel uh, and to uh, get to know our alums and the work that they're doing. Uh, I have... Uh, been working, as you mentioned a moment ago, to, to get to know the students. I've been spending extended one-on-one -on -one time with each member of our governing board, so I've been traveling around the Midwest and around the country to see them. So there's a lot of, of work to do to get to know the, the institution and its strengths and the challenges that it has faced. Um, it's, a, it's a quick pace uh, in, uh, in your in everyday uh, nights and, and weekends. But it's tremendously exhilarating, uh, and uh, we've been so uh, kindly welcomed. People mm -hmm. have been very generous and encouraging to us, so that has lifted us up. Well, can you talk about the current state of Concordia financially? 
Uh, it's in very strong shape. Uh, we had uh, a splendid year uh, in, uh, in admissions. Uh, we reached 100% of our goal for first-year students, and at the same time, uh, we uh, maintained the strong quality of students coming in uh, and have brought in uh, a more diverse class of students from the United States and around the world. We have exceeded uh, our uh, revenue target uh, for, for this uh, current year which is enabling us to launch uh, some strategic uh, initiatives uh, that we were waiting on uh, so that the college is in strong shape. Its uh, endowment, which is an important uh, indicator of financial health, uh, has recovered to, uh, in fact, above its uh, pre-2008 uh, level. Uh, and student retention, uh, which is an important part. Everybody thinks about admissions. But there's also the retention of students uh, to sustain the enrollment of the college and their educational experience. And uh, retention has been ticking up uh, every year and is uh, exceptionally strong for this fall. Okay. And, of course, Concordia, uh, being a private college, probably doesn't have the uh, same issue. Well, Minnesota State uh, bud uh, system budget that, that's dealing with that. Uh, does that affect you in any way with fundraising and well, endowments? Our, uh, well, our... We have common cause with uh, our friends in, in public higher education because all of us need to advance the idea that uh, that education is a public good. It's good for the state of Minnesota. It's good for the state of North Dakota. But yes, private colleges are not as directly and fully dependent on those budget changes. However, we are very glad to see that the Minnesota State uh, Tuition Grant was uh, sustained, which uh, helps make uh, private education affordable. Okay. Uh, let's talk some about the main courses that uh, you mentioned a couple of these that, uh, Con uh, that Concordia College is known for. Mm -hmm. Well, lots of people know about the music uh, because of the, the excellence. Students are so good, John, when they come in that we have uh, a great uh, resource to work with there. And the college is known uh, for the excellence of its choir, the strength of its band and orchestra. Um, the touring uh, that they do uh, gets them out in front of people from across uh, the country. Uh, the Concordia Choir uh, tours nationally and internationally. We're working to get uh, the band uh, to uh, China uh, this coming May, I believe. Uh, so music is a great strength. And one of the things I want to emphasize there is that it's a strength for music majors, but also people who don't major in music. We have a lot of talented musicians who are majoring in chemistry or business or history or philosophy. So it's a pervasive strength in the campus and a great signature for the college. Uh, Concordia also has a justifiably strong uh, record uh, in the natural sciences. Uh, I just uh, this morning sat down with members of the biology faculty. They have a tradition of putting up on a blackboard uh, as well as in more uh, uh, modern forms of technology, but putting up on the blackboard where all the students who recently graduated uh, have gone. Uh, and they're in medical schools, they're in graduate schools, they're in great uh, jobs and programs uh, around the country. So across the natural sciences, we have a really strong record of engaging students in collaborative research one-on-one -on -one with faculty. The medical school placement record is, uh, I think, a nine-to-one chance of getting into med school. So it's an absolutely terrific uh, legacy for us uh, in the sciences. And I mentioned before the tremendous opportunity that we have now with the launching of the Ron Offit uh, School of Business. Mm -hmm. um, it's a terrific thing for us to acknowledge uh, the work and the accomplishments of a graduate as distinguished as uh, Mr. Offit, and we're excited about offering a program in which business learning is deeply integrated with the liberal arts uh, so that our students in business are gaining particular kinds of business acumen at the same time that they're learning cultural competence, at the same time that they're learning what it means for a business person to be a strong citizen, at the same time that they are learning uh, the ethical questions that business people face uh, in, in the world. So those programs are ones for which we are uh, strongly and deservedly known. And we have terrific programs in, uh, in literature, in history, in philosophy, in the languages. There are nine uh, um, world languages offered uh, at, at Concordia. And uh, I want to make sure to mention 
the pre-college program for which Concordia is nationally and internationally known, which is the Concordia Language Villages, uh, located in Bemidji and other places where uh, students from around the United States and around the world are immersed uh, in the learning uh, of that uh, language. So that's one of the best nationally known programs of our college. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do is to uh, increase the connections between the learning that goes on in Bemidji and other places where the villages are and what happens on our own campus. Okay, well, you've, and you covered a lot there, so y'all are doing a lot uh, at Concordia College. Um, but can you talk about some of uh, your history as a Renaissance scholar? Sure. Um, I, uh, I went to grad school. Um, I thought that in Chapel Hill, uh, I thought I was going to do American Lit. Uh, and I wrote a master's thesis on Nathaniel Hawthorne um, and enjoyed that very much. But as time went on, I got more and more drawn uh, into the world of uh, Renaissance literature. So 15th, 16th, 17th century literature in Europe, and in my case, particularly in England. And Oh, I liked it for so many reasons. It's, it covers so many aspects of human experience, uh, romantic, uh, political, educational. Um, but I think what I liked about it best, and as I think about this now, is that the Renaissance was a time when the world was being remade, when language was being refashioned, when our understanding of faith was changing, when the concept of nationhood was first emerging in a strong way, when what we would now call science was being developed. So you had a group of people who had to figure out what the nature of their life would be, that, that their identity would not be something that was simply given to them at birth, but something that they had to hammer out uh, as they worked through their lives. And I think we're in a time like that as well when the nature of the world is changing radically and we're far more engaged in uh, global interconnection than we ever were before. You know, the Renaissance was the time of all the explorations, which have a, a glorious and in some cases inglorious history uh, in, this, in this country, but a time of, of discovery. I think we're in that time again, where the way we think about ourselves, we think about the world, uh, is being challenged in a way that's exciting, a little bit scary, but also exhilarating. So uh, I make a connection between that scholarly experience and what I'm doing now uh, in, in uh, a leadership role at Concordia. Well, I, I was asked to ask you about uh, Shakespeare. Uh, there's been a lot of debate and speculation over whether Shakespeare wrote his uh, plays or did someone else do it. What's your research shown? Well, uh, most of my written research is not about Shakespeare, but I've been teaching Shakespeare for, oh, 30 years now. Uh, and the quick answer is yes, Shakespeare for certain wrote Shakespeare. We have, uh, we have uh, more evidence about the life of William Shakespeare uh, as a writer than we do about many, many others from, from that time. The reason that this question arose, actually, you know, this wasn't a question until the 19th century. Uh, and it arose because there were a number of people who believed that uh, because Shakespeare did not earn a university degree, he could not possibly have written the plays that he did. Uh, and so they went searching for someone with uh, more exalted credentials and often found someone to whom they themselves were related <laughs> in a distant way. Uh, but no, I, there is very strong evidence that Shakespeare was part uh, of an acting troupe in, in, uh, in London uh, that became the best acting troupe of his day and was called upon uh, to produce scripts in a way that would be very similar to uh, someone writing uh, for uh, television or film now. He produced those scripts and the, the people in his company put them on. Okay. Well, with that said, now we'll come back to you. Can you talk some about uh, your academic leadership in sort of uh, uh, the past focusing, focusing on curriculum reform and then again faculty development. Thanks. Um, when I first uh, left graduate school, I had a very uh, uh, focused ambition, which was to be a teacher and a writer. Um, and uh, I had the good fortune uh, when I left Chapel Hill to come to uh, the second oldest Catholic college in the country, Mount St. Mary's which is north of Washington, D.C., and uh, south of Gettysburg, where my family and I lived during that time. And um, when I arrived, 
uh, along with other, um, you, you might say, uh, young Turks uh, on the faculty, I had uh, the opportunity to work to renew the liberal arts curriculum of the college. What we were seeking to do was to ensure that every student at the college, regardless of her major, regardless of his concentration, would have the opportunity to have uh, a deep understanding of their history, uh, of, of the work uh, that uh, had shaped uh, the world and the work that they were enabled to do. So with others, we worked to revise that curriculum. Uh, there was a, a almost a complete overhaul, which really changed the, the shape of that college um, in very significant, significant ways. And I think enriched the lives of the students and faculty there. And I was really lucky to be a part of that. And then when uh, I moved to Luther uh, in the fall of 2000, there was an opportunity to create a more integrated curriculum. And by that, I mean a curriculum in which uh, students would learn uh, the connections between one subject, or as we would say in academic life, one discipline and another. So uh, Luther, uh, and this is chiefly a credit to the faculty, has become a place where there is a increasingly strong integration of uh, thinking and learning and study across disciplines um, at that college. So those are the things that I had been uh, involved in. And both of, those, um, both of those experiences, John, made it very clear to me that faculty learning never stops with the earning of, of, a, of a graduate degree. It needs to continue if faculty are going to be renewed uh, as scholars and if they're going to discover um, their best selves as teachers. So I've been a part of seeking uh, both opportunities and resources to, um, uh, to sponsor that faculty development and have been very lucky, both at Mount St. Mary's and at Luther, to have terrific colleagues to uh, join in that work. Mm -hmm. And working on other areas uh, like the institutional diversity? Yeah, I've, I've been uh, fortunate. I was uh, a fellow of the American Council of Education in 1995-96. And I spent that fellowship year at Dickinson College, which is a very fine private college in central Pennsylvania. It was an opportunity for me to, in effect, shadow the president and the dean. Uh, and I, the project that I was assigned there was to review the college's progress on diversity, meaning diversity in populations, diversity in the curriculum, diversity in the outreach uh, of the college. So I carried that passion um, back with me to Mount St. Mary's when I became the undergraduate dean and very strongly with me uh, to uh, Luther. So the work um, that I did, and all this work is with my colleagues at these places. So was to make a commitment to increase uh, the diversity of the faculty uh, at that college. Uh, because when people think about diversity, they, they often think first of increasing the diversity of the undergraduate population. But that is not going to be a really effective thing unless the college itself is a welcoming and receptive and dynamic place. So I had the opportunity to work with uh, department chairs to bring in a wider number of uh, faculty from uh, different backgrounds in the United States and around the world. I had the great opportunity to work with a very skilled director of the Diversity Center at Luther on how this would affect the programming of the college and with faculty as a whole uh, to help strengthen programs in, uh, for example, in Africana studies, in women's studies, um, and other academic opportunities um, within the curriculum for all of our students. Well, very quickly, uh, I understand you're also the chair of the uh, Y Seminar Advisory Council. What is this? Well, the Y Seminar is part of the Aspen Institute, okay. and the Aspen Institute is dedicated to leadership training for uh, mm -hmm. people in uh, significant positions in our in our country. Um, and the Y Seminar is was conceived. It's named the Y Seminar because it's held. Um, on the eastern shore of Maryland in a very beautiful spot uh, near the Y River. Um, and uh, it's an opportunity for faculty from across different subjects and disciplines to come together and study what you might call foundational texts from around the world uh, on the nature of citizenship and on the nature of learning. So faculty from across the country come there every year. They get to set aside everything and just read and have conversation and debate about this. And now, uh, 
in my time at the seminar, um, there's been uh, an opportunity created for academic deans uh, to come to uh, their own version of the Y seminar. And we also do uh, programs at conferences around the country for college and university presidents. So I just became the chair mm -hmm. of that uh, advisory council, and I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues there to uh, extend that opportunity. Okay. Okay, in about 15 seconds, because we're running out of time, Yeah. what are your goals for the first year as president? To learn about the institution, to pick up the reins of planning, and to ensure that we continue the fundraising we do to meet the uh, goals of the college. Those are my first year goals. Okay. And if people want more information about the college, uh, where can they go? Who can they contact? They should go to www.cord.edu, cord edu and they'll find a, a wealth of information there and they're welcome to call the admissions office uh, on the college as well. Dr. Kraft, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, John. I enjoyed it. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week and as always, thanks for watching.